We're now another week closer to Christmas, and for the kids, that means another week of opening up presents. And we have several people within our church that are going to be celebrating baby's first Christmas. Actually, raise your hand just really quick if you have a baby that's going to be celebrating their first Christmas this year. Raise your hand. We've got several mostly in the back and others as well, so that's pretty neat. As a child, obviously I was a normal kid, and so I could not wait to open up presents. Now, uh, Sunday morning is not the time to get into a debate as to whether or not you should uh, do Santa Claus in your family or not. That's like not the time or place for it, but growing up, my family did do Santa Claus, and it was within balance, of course, uh, but it was a fun thing that my mom and dad would do with us kids every single Christmas, but to a kid such as myself that already struggled with a little bit of anxiety growing up and sleeping at night, telling him that a strange man was going to come into their house in the middle of the night, quietly scurry through the home, um, and while you were in a vulnerable position of sleeping, did not sit well with me as a kid. And so I made it a tradition every single year to wake up in the middle of the night, sneak out of my room, go into the living room to try to find this Santa Claus, and for whatever reason, this Santa Claus guy knew when I would wake up, because I could never find him. But I didn't waste time. I would go underneath the tree, and there would be a few presents that weren't wrapped that Santa Claus dropped off, and so I would take the time to be able to look at all of them, and I knew exactly what I was getting before Christmas morning ever came, because I saw this stuff underneath the tree. And so the next morning, I would go with my family, and of course, did a tremendous job of acting to see that I was surprised by all of that. And I was grateful for all the presents that I received, but the best present that I received when I was a kid was when I was 16 years old, uh, we were doing Christmas down at my grandparents' house in the eastern part of North Carolina, and I remember walking out into the living room and sitting there on the chair was, in a case, my dad's 20-gauge shotgun. Uh, my dad didn't grow up uh, with a, a lot of means. He grew up in a very poor home, and one particular year, he saved up every little bit of money. He would go into the tobacco fields and harvest tobacco, and if you've ever done that, apparently it's a terrible job, uh, but that's what he would do, and he would get a little bit of money, and he saved up as much as he could, and he bought that shotgun when he was about 15, 16 years old. And when I was 16, he handed that shotgun down to me. And I still have it to this day, fire it every once in a while when I can. And it was one of the best Christmas presents that I ever received as a kid because it came from my dad and what it meant for me. But as we continue through our Advent series, we focus on the greatest gift that was ever given to us by our Heavenly Father, and that was Jesus Christ. Last week we began a sermon series uh, titled Because of Jesus. And this sermon series is designed to draw our focus on the world-changing benefits that Jesus brought as he came here to earth. Because of Jesus, we have the four words of Advent, hope, peace, joy, and love. And without Jesus, we would have no reason for joy, celebration, because we would have no hope. Paul says in Galatians chapter 3 or 4 verses 3 through 5, he says, Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. That phrase there, when the fullness of time has come, means that when God saw fit in his sovereignty to send his Son, he did so. And we have grace because of Jesus Christ. This entire Christmas series focuses on the life-changing benefits that only Jesus brings. Jesus is the gift that truly satisfies the deep need that every single man and woman longs for. Last week we began this series by focusing on because of Jesus we have rest. Jesus offers the invitation in Matthew chapter 11 verse 28. He says, come to me all you are a labor." All you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And as we looked at last week, this is not an invitation for physical rest, but rather the burden that would be relieved because of Jesus that every man faces because of the law. The law condemns. The law is a burden that is placed upon the shoulders of man that mankind cannot live up to. Jesus says, come unto me that you are tired of living underneath the pressures of the law, and I will give you rest. He says, take my yoke upon you, because it is easy and it is not burdensome. In other words, the burden of the law is something that is extremely burdensome, but the burden of Jesus is not. Jesus offers true hope because everything that needed to be done was accomplished in Jesus. So because of Jesus, we find rest. Take your Bibles and turn with me in Matthew chapter 12 as we continue on in our journey this morning uh, in the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 12, we're going to be... Um, journeying through the next chapter here 
The Apostle Matthew begins chapter 12 by recounting two different events regarding the behavior of Jesus uh, on the Sabbath day specifically. The fourth commandment states, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It was a command to the Jews to set aside the seventh day of week, which was Saturday, is Saturday, to worship God. Now, within the Torah, the Torah, which is another name of the first five books of the Bible, which is also known as the law, it prohibits doing any kind of work on the Sabbath, but the Torah itself does not clearly explain which type of work is included, which is why there's a lot of confusion regarding what we should do on the Sabbath day and what we shouldn't do on the Sabbath day. Do we pick grain or do we not pick grain? The Torah itself actually only gives two uh, specific things, and, and that, is, um, uh, that, 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 is, that is the uh, separation of, of really the, the work that you're supposed to do within the tabernacle itself and also not buying and selling uh, land. And so the rabbis, doing the best that they could, came up with good intentions, some with not so good intentions, additional laws to further clarify what you should and shouldn't do on the Sabbath day. And it's created a lot of confusion for people. And really, to kind of give you the context here, the Sabbath rule was given during the time of the tabernacle's construction. And within the tabernacle, there were various rules and duties in which people had to follow through. The law, specifically in Leviticus, gives these instructions. It says in Leviticus chapter 19, verse 30, You shall keep my Sabbath and reverence my sanctuary. I am the Lord. For the Jew, the construction of the tabernacle was intended to, uh, to achieve the exact objective as the creation of the world itself. And if I can explain it this way, for us to be able to understand it in relationship to our current terms, I'm going to explain it in this regard. The tabernacle, before Jesus Christ came to earth, was this dwelling place of God, right? It was the intersection between heaven and earth. It was the tabernacle itself, which is why you had the Holy of Holies that no one could enter into unless it was the priest, because that was where God himself was. And so when we look at the nation of Israel, we see the, uh, the children of Israel walking and wandering through the wilderness there with Moses. They would carry the tabernacle with them. The tabernacle would be set up, and that would be the presence of the Lord. So, Pastor Brandon, why does the tabernacle not apply to us today? Because the Bible makes a shift in the New Testament. When Jesus Christ comes and dies on our behalf, we have new life through him. The Bible says that you now are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so the tabernacle, or the intersection, I should say, say between heaven and earth is you as the Christian you are in essence the dwelling place of God which is why we don't gather and keep the tabernacle everywhere with us which is why we use the phrase that the church itself is not the building it's the people and that's 100% the truth but in the Old Testament it wasn't that case you had the actual function of the tabernacle now within the Torah there's only two Sabbath rules that I uh, said earlier it is, it, that, that are expressed. You cannot kindle a fire, and you cannot carry the transfer of domains. That's all that it says. But to carry out the Sabbath to a further degree, the rabbis developed an additional 37 rules that pertain to the activity that was forbidden on the Sabbath, and it all has to do with the activities that take place within the tabernacle. Now, the tabernacle itself had four categories of, of functions that you can kind of explain to, 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 help over, uh, to help explain the overarching roles within the tabernacle. Now, within the tabernacle itself, you have the order of the bread, you have the order of the garments, the order of hides, and the order of the construction. And a more, among those four categories, you had a myriad of different functions that the rabbis took and applied that as something that you could not do on the Sabbath day. For example, you've heard of some of these. Within the order of bread, you could not plant Plow, reap, gather, thresh, winnowing, sorting, purification, grinding, sifting, kneading, cooking, baking, none of that was allowed on the Sabbath day. When it came to the order of garments, you could not shear, launder, comb wool, dye, spin, warp, thread, weave, separating two threads, untying, sewing, tearing. That was not allowed on the Sabbath day. When it came to the order of hides, you could not trap, kill, fish, skin, preserve, smooth, score, or measured cutting was not allowed in any way. And when it came to the order of construction, you could not write, erase, construct, de uh, demolish, extinguish a fire, ignite a fire, fine tune, or transfer between domains in any way all of those constituted as the rules regarding the sabbath that were demonstrated or made up by the rabbis it is not what the torah says 
Okay, so now that we have an understanding, you have within the Old Testament these rules that the people had to follow on the Sabbath day. In essence, they could not do anything. Fast forward to Jesus Christ. Some preachers say, uh, one particular preacher said many years ago that Jesus Christ came and he broke the law for love. That is borderline blasphemous. Jesus never broke the law. It's very clear that he never breaks the law. He fulfills the law. So when it comes to the Sabbath controversies that we refer to this Matthew section here, uh, some could ha- the Pharisees specifically could assume and accuse Jesus of actually breaking the Sabbath law when Jesus says, I broke nothing. These are just rules that you made up yourself. And once again, we see the presence of Jesus turn the world upside down. So we pick this up in Matthew chapter 12. Read with me the first 14 verses here, and we'll go over that this morning. It says, at that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and the disciples were hungry. And they began to pluck the heads of grain and to eat. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests? Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there was one greater than the temple." But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless, for the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Now when he had departed from there, he went into their synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand, and they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath, that they might accuse him? Then he said to them, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value, then, is a man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. Then he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and plotted against him how they might destroy them. This time, Jesus and his ministry was defining the difference between what he can do and what man does in relationship to the call of the Father. As we have stressed repeatedly, the law was not given to mankind to make mankind holy, but to reveal the inadequacies of mankind in order to push them to Jesus Christ. In addition to the laws designed to convict man, the law was given to the children of Israel to set them apart from the rest of the world. The law regarding the Sabbath was a means of God's people setting themselves apart for the worship of God and the reverence of the one true God at least that one specific day of the week. But, Just as mankind tends to do even today, the Jewish leaders took the command further than it was intended to go. Therefore, the Sabbath, which was meant to be a refreshing time of worship, actually became a burden among many of the Jewish people. So through this portion of Matthew, we see Jesus set the record straight regarding the Sabbath. What mankind turned into a burden, Jesus offered to grace, which gives us the title of our next message this morning within this series. Because of Jesus, we have grace. The words grace and mercy are foundational words within the Christian faith. They both mean different things, but you cannot take one and not have the other when it comes to, when it comes to uh, salvation. Grace is giving us something that we do not deserve. Grace can be summed up in one word, and that is heaven. Okay? Everything that heaven stores for us and has for us is all summed up in that word grace. We do not deserve it. Mercy, on the other hand, is not giving us something or withholding something that we do deserve, And that, of course, can be summed up in the removal from hell and the restoration to the Father. That's mercy. And it's all because of Jesus. But grace goes beyond, as we understand in Scripture, and eternity in heaven. It intersects with our life today. Ephesians, up on your screen, says in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7, the Apostle Paul says, In him, meaning Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Our salvation is made possible through the redemption of Jesus Christ. That word redeem means to buy back. We've talked about this multiple times here. But again, redemption, for those of you that are not as familiar with it, means to buy back. And the currency that can only be used for that is the blood of Jesus. We understand that when we were initially created, we were underneath the ownership of God and God solely and fully. But the time that Adam and Eve chose to go their own way and fall into sin, they were now removed from the ownership of God and they were placed into the ownership of the world, ultimately Satan and the bondage of sin. 
He was removed from that, and then we see God taken beyond that, and we see that Jesus Christ gives that, uh, uh, that, that redemption through his son. He buys us back through Jesus. Paul adds in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 11, in him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Christ affords us an inheritance. What is that inheritance? Once again, it is heaven. But part of God's grace through Jesus is this accomplishment of the law. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, Do not think that I came to destroy the law of the prophets. I did not come to destroy. I came to fulfill or to complete. Jesus says that everything that the law pointed to man was fulfilled through himself. And so when it comes to this conversation that he has with with the Pharisees regarding the Sabbath, Jesus is not only revealing his deity once again to them, he's helping them see that he himself is there to fulfill the law, therefore offer grace. And so the first thing that we see here when we compare the law of man to the grace of God is this. Man confuses, but Jesus clarifies. Man confuses, but Jesus clarifies. Matthew recounts in beginning of verse 1, he says, At that time Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck grains of, uh, heads of grain and to eat. I want you to envision with me for a moment what is taking place here. Jesus Christ is walking with his disciples on the Sabbath day. They walk along the field of corn, and uh, they pick grain from the fields, and they begin to eat it. The Pharisees were not upset in the fact that they, what some would perceive as being stealing or, or thieving them, because that, the, the, that was not their field, because the law actually gives permission to do that. The law says in Deuteronomy chapter 23, verse 25, he says, When you come into your neighbor's standing grain, you may pluck the heads of your grain, but you shall not eat using a sickle on your neighbor's standing grain. In other words, you cannot go there and plow for yourself the grain, but you could pick some if you were to eat it. So their issue wasn't with that, that, that wasn't stealing. Their issue was the action of that taking place on the Sabbath day itself. Look at verse 2. It says, when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. The Pharisees' accusation goes back to what we discussed earlier regarding the ordering of bread as it pertained to the tabernacle. They perceived that as being something that they were gathering. They were, the, the mere act of them picking the grain and, 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 and threshing it in their hand, they perceived as being work, and therefore they were breaking the Sabbath law. But beyond all of that, they were even more upset with this man Jesus and not saying anything to that action. Jesus Christ just let it happen. Therefore, giving permission to these men to do so. But here's the problem with the Pharisees' accusation. According to the law itself, there was no law prohibiting the plucking and eating of the grain on the Sabbath. The law prohibited the labor for the sake of profit. In other words, you could not go out there and gather the grain on the Sabbath day in order to go and sell it, but you absolutely could go out there, pick the grain so that you and your family could eat. Right, God's not unreasonable in his laws there. So what they did was absolutely permissible. The problem here is that man confused the elements of the law by adding a further mandate to fellow man. Mandate, uh, mankind elevated, in this case, preference to the level of the gospel. Some of you may have been involved in churches that have done that very same thing. They've taken the preferences of man and they've elevated that to the level of the gospel and we refer to that is as legalism. Legalism in its broadest sense emphasizes a system of rules and regulations for achieving both salvation and spiritual growth. It's a checklist, if you will, of things we must do and not do to gain favor with God and legalism is a doctrine that essentially opposes grace. Now, I don't ever do this, or very rarely do I do this, but I'm going to do it now. Go ahead and just raise your hand and tell me some elements that are legalistic that oftentimes the churches have within their buildings today. All right, what is a, what is a legalistic thing that churches tend to take and promote it to the level of gospel? Anybody have any suggestions? Yes. Dress, okay, specifically, and maybe some cases, ladies wearing dresses, right? Okay, yes. Coffee in the auditorium? Yeah, that's a really strict church. <laughs> what else? What are other, what are other elements of, of legalism that, that we run into today? Music is another one. TJ, music, okay. Um, I dare, what's that? Yes. King James, wow, the King James version is another one, version issue, okay. 
Make sure nobody's like moving in their chair weird right now to that comment. Um, to be honest, to be completely honest, alcohol is oftentimes something that is elevated to a legalistic standpoint. Um, dancing, right? Dancing could be, uh, we're not going to get into all the other principles behind it, but what I mean by that is when you take something within Scripture, like what the Pharisees did, and you elevate that to the level of gospel doctrine, that's when it becomes legalistic. Okay? You must do this, and if you don't do this, then you are a dirty, rotten sinner, okay? which we all are, but you, God loves you less, in other words. The Pharisees were taking this whole action of picking grain, elevating that to the level of gospel when it was not there. It was something that they added on their own. Uh, the issue with legalism is that it does confuse God's grace with the foundation of the gospel. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 14, verse 1, he says, to receive one who is weak in the faith, but not to dispute over doubtful things. And unfortunately, there are those that feel so strongly about non-essential doctrines that they will literally run others out of their fellowship, not even allowing the expression of another person's opinion. And what I mean by opinion is maybe the helpful conversation regarding the legitimacy of dress or, or certain things you ought to wear. Yeah, obviously, we don't ever stray on what the Bible actually says, but we have to be very careful and focus only on what this actually says. But the Pharisees did not. Jesus, on the other hand, offers clarity. Look at what he says in verse 3, beginning there. He says, But he said to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God, ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are not blameless? Yet I say to you that in this place there is one greater than the temple. And I love what Jesus does here. He does not respond back to the Pharisees and say, you bunch of hypocritical legalists. He actually refers back to history of things that they knew took place and used that to support his reasoning of the fact that they were not breaking the Sabbath. This is absolutely ingenious by Jesus. First, this is what Jesus does. He helps the Pharisees understand that the Sabbath laws do not restrict the deeds of necessity. He says, have you not read what David did when he was hungry? He entered into the house of God and he ate the showbread. This might be a little bit confusing for some of us, so let me explain. Every single week, um, 12 loaves of bread would be baked to represent the 12 tribes of Israel, and they would be pr placed into the tabernacle, and uh, they would remain there, and then the priests had the permission to be the ones to eat that bread. Okay, That was the only ones that were supposed to eat that bread. But what we see in, uh, in Samuel is David is with his men, who obviously he was not a priest, and um, he's hungry. He goes into there, into the temple there, and he eats the bread with his men, Although the law says he technically should not do that, he did not break the law because he was doing this out of necessity. If that was the only food they had to eat and so they ate it, we don't see anywhere in Scripture where God condemns that, which helps us understand that when it comes to necessity, that the laws uh, give permission for you to be able to take part in that. Going back to Matthew chapter 12, Jesus uses this example to support the act of the disciples picking the grain and eating out of necessity. First, Jesus defends this action by helping the Pharisees understand the Sabbath laws do not restrict the deeds of necessity. Secondly, Jesus defends his action by reminding the Pharisees that the law did not prohibit service to God on the Sabbath. This is what he says in verse 5. He says, Have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath, but yet they are blameless? Technically speaking... The priests were working. They had to fulfill the functions of the church, of the tabernacle. And so if they were technically working, then were they breaking the law? Well, according to the Pharisees, they would have been. But the Bible says here that they were blameless because that was their responsibility. In other words, Jesus was reminding Pharisees that when it comes to work or not work, there are some that must do so, and they specifically are the priests. They had the responsibility of carrying out the service to God. Once again, Jesus is demonstrating before the Pharisees that some aspects of the Sabbath restrictions were not inviolable absolutes, but rather precepts pertaining to the ceremonial features of the law. Jesus further pushes his claim by making this bold statement in verse 6. He says, Yet I say to you that in this place there was one greater than the temple. Who is Jesus talking about? Himself. 
What is Jesus saying? He's saying that there is a greater thing than the temple, which is himself. Therefore, Jesus is boldly proclaiming before the Pharisees that he himself is God. You think that sat well with the Pharisees? No, made him further mad. Let's wrap all this together. What Jesus is doing is he is clarifying what man confused when it came to the rules of the Sabbath. He is assuring the Pharisees that the disciples indeed did not break the law because the law did not mandate against the actions of necessity. In addition, Jesus urges the Pharisees to focus on the intent of the Sabbath laws, which was to direct worship to God alone, and then he reveals himself as the one in whom they should be worshiping on the Sabbath, and that is the one that is greater than the Sabbath, and that is he himself. And if we can all boil this down to one point, it's this. Do not ever push the letter of the law over the spirit of the law. Do not elevate something that is a man-made preference over the gospel itself because only, the only thing that ever does is offer confusion. Man confuses, Jesus clarifies. Secondly, man conforms, Jesus transforms. Look at verse seven. He says, but if you had not, or if you had known what this phrase means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would have not condemned the guiltless. Jesus is actually quoting something they would have been familiar with. It would have been in the Old Testament scriptures, and that is Hosea chapter six, verse six. Many of you are familiar with uh, the book, maybe not as much with Hosea as you would be with Matthew, but Hosea was a, what we refer to as one of the minor prophets that was raised up by God to proclaim the truth to the northern kingdom of Israel, which is what we refer to as Israel. You had the two kingdoms split after the reign or the death of Solomon into the northern kingdom, which we refer to as Israel, and the southern kingdom being Judah. Hosea was raised up by God to proclaim the truth that God still loves his chosen people even though they continuously turn his back, their back on God. And a visual illustration of this, which is one of those questions that I'm going to ask when I get to heaven because it's just extremely fascinating. I understand the symbolism behind it, but God commanded Hosea to marry someone. Does anybody know what type of person that was? It was a prostitute. Why was he doing that? Why would, what was the symbolism behind that? He wanted through a living illustration to demonstrate that God still loves his people even though when they continuously commit spiritual adultery upon him by going out and worshiping other gods and doing things of the other gods. But in Hosea chapter 6, verse 6, Hosea says, For I desire, on behalf of God, for I desire mercy and not sacrifice and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. The point that Hosea was making is that religious rituals can help people understand God and nourish their relationship with him, but a religious ritual is helpful only if it is carried out out of an attitude of love for and obedience to God, not a checklist. Not a checklist, which is why we've said over and over again, religion does not work. It doesn't work. It's all about the relationship that only Jesus offers. Jesus adds in verse 8, he says, for the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Once again, Jesus is proclaiming his deity before the Pharisees. He was reminding the Pharisees of who the Sabbath was for, and Jesus was proclaiming his authority over the Sabbath. And as Christians, we have to be very careful in doing things just for the sake of doing them. We must do all things for the honor and the glory of God because that is the very purpose of living. God requires more and offers and, and, and is more... Um, in need of our desire for, for loving him than rather than checking off the box and doing the rituals. We are not called to conform to the law, which is what man tells him to do, but we are called to be transformed by the grace that Jesus offers. Man conforms, Jesus transforms, but finally, number three, man condemns, but Jesus restores. Man condemns, but Jesus restores. Matthew continues on with this other encounter in verses 9 through 14. He reports in verse 9, Now when he had departed from there, leaving the Pharisees upset with what just happened, but yet, obviously Jesus was 100% right, he went into their synagogue, and behold, there was a man who had a withered hand. And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath that they might accuse him? Now, the intention behind the question from the Pharisees is made clear in that phrase, that they might accuse him. They could care less what Jesus said. They could care less what the right or wrong answer was because that wasn't their intent to gain information. Their intent was to accuse Jesus. And that's all they ever wanted to do. The Pharisees did not question 
or care about the needs of the person that had a withered hand. They only cared about trying to prove Jesus wrong, and Jesus knew exactly what they were trying to do. Jewish tradition prohibited the practice of medicine on the Sabbath, but there was an exemption to that. There was an exemption to those that had a life-threatening situation, but the problem was that this simple Jewish tradition, again, was made to be a gospel when it was not. There was no actual law in the Old Testament that prohibited the giving of medicine, healing, or any other acts of mercy on the Sabbath. The law emphasizes that it is always lawful to do good, even if it is on the Sabbath. But the Pharisees' only concern was to condemn man rather than to restore man. Jesus uh, says in Matthew chapter 11, verse 12, What man is there among you who has one sheep, and if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not lay hold of it and lift it out? Of how much more value then is that man than a sheep? Therefore, it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And Jesus is using a point, once again, to help the people understand that they are being absolutely ridiculous. He's using the life of the sheep because none of them, would keep a sheep that is dying, that is their livelihood, down in a ditch to let them die. They would rescue that sheep so that they could sell that sheep and have more money for their family. They wouldn't do that. But he's using the life of a sheep and then comparing that to the refusal of wanting to heal that man's hand and saying, is this man's life, his well-being, not much more valuable than the life of the sheep? Well, they couldn't say anything. They don't say anything. They have no response for Jesus. Christ framed this issue in terms of a clear-cut extreme. He's comparing the life of a man to the life of a sheep, and the Pharisees could do nothing but keep silent. Matthew continues in verse 13. Then he said to them, to the man, stretch out your hand, and he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the other. Jesus healed the man fully and completely, and this is all we ever see from Jesus, is grace. Is there judgment? Yes. Does God ultimately judge the sinner? Absolutely, he does. But all Jesus ever came to do was give grace to man. All Jesus ever came to do was to give new life to man. And all the Pharisees ever wanted to do was condemn man. What a beautiful reminder that we have this Christmas as we celebrate this Christmas season, the grace that Jesus has. But what a beautiful reminder we have as a church that when people come in and they may, I'll pause here for just a moment and I, and I praise the Lord because I don't sense that our church body is like this in any way. But somebody comes in and they may smell a little bit different, they may look a little bit different, they don't look churchy. That we don't just simply look on the outward appearance of man, but by the grace of God, we look at what they truly need and that is the life transformation of Jesus Christ. We have people in our church right now that have a myriad of different things in their background that may be far more colorful than yours. But we all have one thing in common, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ doesn't hold those things over our heads. He only ever came here to give us grace. And I love the physical illustration that Jesus does with this man. This man has a withered hand, And the ones that are supposed to help him, the church, refused him. The church was supposed to take care of this man, but they rejected this man because they were too busy trying to be self-righteous and holy. But Jesus says, come here, give me your hand, and Jesus heals it. The Bible says, fully and completely. And that's all that Jesus ever does, is he doesn't give us partial healing He doesn't give us partial redemption. Now, we are still in an unglorified body, but our full redemption will take place. When Jesus does something for us in regards to salvation, when he does that, he heals us fully and completely. And my prayer as we close this morning, and I praise God that I don't sense that now, but my prayer is that we never, never be like what we see in verse 14. The Bible says that the Pharisees went out after Jesus, what he just did. They didn't rejoice with Jesus. They didn't rejoice at this man being healed. The Bible says in verse 14 that they went out and they plotted against him how they might destroy him. And how many churches today, without ever actually saying that they want to destroy Jesus, are doing so because of their judgmental, legalistic attitudes? They're too busy trying to confuse rather than clarify. They're too busy trying to add their own mandates rather than what Jesus says. And they're certainly too busy 
with trying to cause man to be at a certain level of righteousness that only they define, but not what Jesus defines. And in so many ways, all they're ever doing is they're destroying the name of Jesus to a community that so desperately needs him. That's my prayer for this church, is that this Christmas we do not forget what Jesus came to do, and that was to offer grace. Because of Jesus, we have grace. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord,